Locked up in a Russian prison, jailed for doing his job. Tonight marks exactly one year since Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich was wrongly detained. Tonight we ask, is Washington doing enough to bring Americans locked up overseas, like Evan, home? We speak to one man whose girlfriend, an American ballerina, languishes in a Russian cell, all because she got on the wrong side of the Putin regime. Plus, a mad scramble to clear the wreckage and get the Baltimore port up and running. And that might be the easy part. Next comes a years-long rebuild of that shattered bridge. Who should foot the bill? As the shock wears off, now a rising number of voices say, not the taxpayers, no matter what the president has promised. And it's not exactly a flash mob, but people are pilfering from the president's plane. Items missing and presumed stolen from Air Force One? How could that happen? We'll explain who the culprits are coming up. Happy Good Friday, everyone, and thank you for being here with us. I'm Mike Vaccaro, filling in for Blake Berman. The Hill on News Nation starts right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome in on Good Friday. Joining us today, Lee Carter, a Republican pollster. Kurt Bardella, we know him, we love him, a Democratic strategist. Brad Howard is here. He's also a Democratic strategist. And Aaron Perini, a Republican strategist. And, of course, joining us remotely is Mick Mulvaney, News Nation political and economic contributor and former acting chief of staff for the Trump White House. Hello to you all. We begin with a look at a very unusual front page today, of the Wall Street Journal. The blank space symbolizing the articles and reports missing from their reporter, Evan Gerskovich, he would have filed over the course of the last year. That's how long he's been wrongfully detained in Russia, for one year now on espionage charges. Today, President Biden released a statement saying, quote, as I have told Evan's parents, I will never give up hope either. We will continue working every day to secure his release, and we will continue to stand strong against all those who seek to attack the press or target journalists, the pillars of free society. This week, a Russian court extended Gerskovich's pre-trial detention at least until June 30th, and it's still unclear when Gerskovich may be freed or whether a trial will be held at all. Okay, panel, one year. What does this say about, num- number one, the efforts to try to free him, and number two, uh, what Vladimir Putin is up to? Is he a bargaining chip, Aaron? Oh, absolutely. Vladimir Putin sees this as another opportunity to hold something over the head of the United States. And given the geopolitical disaster that is the Biden administration, you can look at any number of things, Nord Stream 2, the capitulation on that, empowering Putin, emboldening Russia. This is another opportunity for for Russia to thumb their nose at the United States and say that we are no longer the power because Joe Biden's at the helm. I have to strongly disagree with her assessment that somehow Biden is empowering Putin when the Democrats and Biden are the ones standing up to fund and defend Ukraine, to push back against his aggression in the region. I think if you look at the president's, well, number one, it's a reminder to how grateful we are to live in a democracy where we have freedom of the press. But if you look at the president's statement, the second, the last sentence was particularly interesting because he said to all those who target the press, clearly a dig at President Trump, who is known to attack the press. All right. What do you think, Kurt? I mean, ultimately, the result is what matters. So as long as, you know, anyone who's been taken hostage is still under Russian and and Putin control and being kept under these Mm -hmm. bogus claims, people are going to blame the president. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, it just as if he gets released, the president will get the credit for that as well. Mm -hmm. But until there's a result, we're going to keep having this conversation in circles. American people, uh, how often do you think they, they think about Evan? It's a tough question to ask, but I'd like to I'd I think, like to ask. I think it's been really top of mind for a lot of people because yeah. it keeps getting shown by the media. We're all standing in solidarity. Uh-huh. Everybody sees this. And we, we have the number of people abroad that are being detained. Yeah, it's not just Evan. Soon, yeah. And I think it's just really important to remember that. And I, I do think that Joe Biden is going to pay the price pay the price for this. I think that a lot of people look at this and you see his polling numbers on foreign affairs and he just does not poll as well as Donald I do Trump. think that Brad makes a good point though that as long as it's the Republicans who are right now the reason why the war in Ukraine is not going to be continued to be funded. The reason there is a war in Ukraine is a direct reflection of Joe Biden's geopolitical news. That's all fine. I'm just saying as long as the narrative is hey there is an effort to try to fund this 
fund this war okay. to back but, Ukraine. And and if the Speaker of the House puts the bill on the floor, he might lose okay. his so, job. So that's that's where we're at right now. That's what's actually happening. The question is that the, the administration isn't doing enough. Yeah, absolutely. The reason there is a war and emboldened Russia is because of the capitulation by Joe Biden on Nord Stream 2 by allowing Russia to circumvent Ukraine and be able to move natural gas to Germany. Russia was able then to invade Ukraine because they didn't need them in the same way anymore. The fact that we are seeing our okay. geopolitical yeah. foes on the rise is a direct reflection of the geopolitical failures of the Biden administration. Right. Militarily, Russia thinks they can invade, and they did. They would have done no matter who was president. There is only no, one candidate running for president who is unabashedly defending money and funds and support for Ukraine to defend itself against Putin aggression okay. and one that's calling out. But real quick to your point about Evan and about that do the American people care enough? Unfortunately, because of Donald Trump, there's a huge swath of the American people that have no respect for journalists who think they're somehow nefarious in efforts. And so because of that, I think it's gotten less attention than, say, Brittany, the basketball player who was released and got a lot of publicity around it. I think people remember that a little more. Unfortunately, okay. it, this right, is a big problem. We're going to have an opportunity to pick this up a little bit later in the show because coming up, we'll speak with the boyfriend of an American ballerina who was detained over one month ago and currently languishes in a Russian prison. Now, as the border crisis mounts, a new poll shows that American views on immigration are changing. 41% of Americans think legal immigrants are a major benefit for American companies, but that's down from 59% in 2017. And on crime, 32% of Americans see a major risk of legal immigrants committing crimes. That is up 19% from the same poll in 2017. You're the pollster. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is this a reflection of? Well, look, we're seeing a huge shift in, in, in how people are viewing immigration. And it's not surprising that this is happening at the same time as it's become the number one concern of voters across the board um, over the economy. It's more important to voters right now than the economy, certainly among independents and Republicans. I know that Democrats have a different set of issues. They're most of concerned about democracy, climate change, and guns. But immigration is number one and number two for Republicans and independents. And I think you're seeing uh, that reflection, how concerned people are about I mean, this whole question it. of jobs. You know, immigrants filling jobs. I'm, I'm thinking right now the people fixing the potholes and that tragedy in the, on the Baltimore Bridge. I don't think right? the issue is about the jobs as much as people are concerned about the immigration process and that there's a lot of criminals sure. that are coming apart. I think a lot of people will say they want legal immigration. A lot of people will say we want to get people in here the right way. We want to make sure that people are vetted. But I don't. I think that people are seeing so many videos. We're having so many different stories that we're seeing of crime that's happening that the concern is just increasing. And it's not just fear mongering on the part of the Republican Party. I think this is absolutely it, yeah. something that people are seeing. And another time and another day, uh, what we used to call Chamber of Commerce Republicans were very much pushing yeah. immigration. I think they still are. I mean, they were, they were yeah. at the heart of the push for what they called then comprehensive immigration reform. Right. Yeah. The, the famed McCain-Kennedy bipartisan bill back in... For the, workers. Right. I mean, I mean, we have to differentiate here the conversation about legal immigration exactly. and illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. sure. I, think that, that, I think everybody here would agree with And that. I think yeah. that gets a little muddied sometimes in the political rhetoric about this from all corners of this. But when you do have one side labeling immigrants okay. as poisonous and all of that, like, I think that has an impact on the overall opinion when these kind of questions get asked. When someone gets asked this question by a pollster and they were just watching a segment yeah. about something like that, they're going to answer that way. Okay. All right. We're off to a running start here, but we're <laughs> going to keep it moving. Tonight, a man who has gone on TikTok encouraging others to come to the U.S. and squat at home. <laughs> He's now in federal custody. Sources tell News Nation Lionel Moreno is known as the migrant influencer. I learned that there is a law that says if a house is not inhabited, we can take it. Here in the United States, terrain deformation also applies. Okay, the Venezuelan crossed the border illegally in April at Eagle Pass, Texas, of all places. That was April of 2022, according to Homeland Security sources and reported by our Allie Bradley just now on the border. So after being <clears throat> caught, he was put in a federal program allowing tracking by immigration officials with ankle monitors, but he reportedly violated the terms of his release and went on the lam, absconded in the legal term. Late today, News Nation reported that he was caught today in Ohio. Okay, Aaron, let's leave it off with you. This individual has gained so much attention because he sort of personifies uh, what's happening and, and, and the concern that people have. I mean, moving into people's houses, this man is uh, essentially doing a, a how-to mm -hmm. on the Internet 
of how to take over houses that don't belong to them. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the double story there, right? It's the illegal immigration. It's the fact that this gentleman absconded, that he fled federal authorities, that he illegally entered the country, and now he is there encouraging other people to take what rightly belongs to American citizens, which is their own property and their homes. And you're seeing a lot more stories covering the squatters, squatters' rights. You saw the bill this week in Florida that mm-hmm. eliminates squatters' rights and gives the property mm-hmm. back to the property owner. This is the double... This is the double I'm, I'm just curious, where, are these rule, where are these laws and rules across the country allowing people to move into somebody else's property where they came from? What was the genesis of that? Well, this, is, this is the typical unintended consequences of well-minded legislation that you have to deal with. I was the chief of staff on the Hill. And when you're writing these, this is why you bring in all the stakeholders and industry folks to make sure you're addressing everything. Uh-huh. This clearly is an unintended consequence of that in the sense that there were there are strong renter protections and, and various things of people can't kick you out of your home. He is clearly taking advantage of that. But what I was going back to your question about polling an immigrant attitude towards migrants, that framework from the 2000s has shifted from an economic one to a security one. Right. And that's exactly. what the problem has turned into. And Americans yeah. starting to realize as they have broader security concerns, what with public safety, law enforcement from the Black Lives Matter protests yeah. and defund the police, not to mention what's going on abroad, Americans feel less secure. And the Republicans have sensed that and wow. taken advantage of it politically. I, I think we all agree on that, too. We're yeah. really on a roll here. Okay, we got to move on, Brett. Uh, Kurt, I'm sorry. This is actually a bipartisan uh, fix, panel believe tonight. it or not. <laughs> well, on a good the bill that was signed into Florida was introduced by a Democrat lawmaker who had this happen to her at one of her properties. Oh, wow. Did you use Democrat as an adjective just then? Yeah. All right. <laughs> President Biden now says he will visit the scene of the Baltimore Bridge accident next week. There's a growing debate over who should pay for the rebuilding of the bridge. It collapsed, of course, as we all saw tragically after the crash. The president has said the federal government will pick up the tab. Since the accident involved a private ship company losing, and that ship losing control and hitting the bridge, more and more Republicans say the federal government should not pay the whole bill. According to Republican Representative Ralph Norman, a staunch conservative, the very thought of having, quote, I'm quoting here, the very thought of having the federal government pay for the Baltimore Bridge is totally absurd. This exemplifies the old slogan, of robbing Peter to pay Paul. I'm not exactly sure how that applies uh, in this case. But, uh, you know, this, there's a case to be made, and I think a valid case, that mm-hmm. this is a national emergency, right? This is an yeah. interstate highway uh, administered by the federal government, built famously in the Eisenhower administration, added on to ever since. Uh, there are billions of dollars at stake in U.S. trade, supply chain repercussions. Mm-hmm. Who should pay here? I think it needs to be both parties, but this should not solely fall to the federal government. Joe Biden, what he said, which he generally does, is he gets overly verbose in his language. He does the alls and things like that. Well, we will pay for all of this. No, the company that is rightfully the, the people who own that ship, they need to be held accountable for the fact that yeah, there was a failure. Fault. That's the key question. Well, I mean, the, yeah. the ship clearly lost power and smashed into a bridge and took it down. Yeah. The, the, you got to neg- you gotta prove negligence. I mean, okay. No, you don't have to prove negligence because the fact that it happened means that, there's a, that, that there is a level of culpability within this anyways. Whether or not it was intentional and accident okay. or negligence, Fair they should need to, Guys, they need to be held accountable. We have someone who was the uh, director of the Office of Management and OMB. The M stands for management. <laughs> the B stands for budget. He knows how this stuff works. Let's bring in Mick Mulvaney. Mick, how is this going to play out over the course of, I guess, months and years? It's going to be a billion dollar project, billion dollar project, more than billion with an S. Yeah, this is easy, and I'm going to ignore for the second that the guy who said it was robbing Peter to pay Paul is my <laughs> congressman. I think you got a little insight into the representation I'm getting these days. Um, this is an easy one. Um, the federal government's going to front the money, and the federal government yeah. should yes. front the money. Yep. This is so important. Yep. We, will, we will pay for it now and worry about who ultimately pays for it afterwards. You cannot stop yes. any of the work. In fact, the Biden administration did the right thing today. There's a bunch of mm-hmm. Navy construction ships in the area now that needs to get fixed. It needs to get fixed immediately, and we can worry later about who's going to pay for it. It's not going to be the taxpayers, at least not entirely. This is an easy call for a White House. I'd be telling President Trump, look, we need to do everything we can to get the thing open, and then let's worry later about where the money comes from. Right, and, and Lee, uh, I think we're going to hear growing voices when Congress gets back from their two-week recess, I guess, next week. Um, Are they going to get any traction whatsoever on this? Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of traction about this. this, I mean, what... To, to be clear, I think that there's going to be a lot of debate about about this and who will, uh-huh. who, who funds it. I think that Biden misspoke for sure that he he shouldn't have said that they're going to foot the bill, and I think we're going to see all kinds of arguments and debate over this and who has it, how's it going to be addressed. But the bottom line is we've got to get to the bottom of, of culpability. We've got to get to the bottom of this, and there's no way the federal government's going to foot all of it. But I couldn't agree more. 
federal government has to do everything yeah. they can. So Biden, exactly. Biden, the president's credit, what he said is we're not going to wait. Right. And so that's a very different than because we're going to pay, pay for it all. Yeah, well, he, he said, but he says, we're not going to wait. We're going to pay for it all. And then his up people front. came back and said, uh, uh, which is, very, which is what he did. Which is very to her point. the Biden administration, yeah. where he said something that his team has to come in. On and the clean fundamental it up. question. The but he didn't say anything wrong. He just didn't present it. Point of historical context. That I-35 bridge built in 14 months, the one over in, uh, in uh, Minnesota in, in 2007 that collapsed. Of course, it wasn't hit by a ship. Uh, and then, of course, famously, the Philadelphia Bridge was right. was erected in like two weeks after that tragic and fire. It's unbelievable. Having a one-seat majority in Congress would be tough to pass out <laughs> right now to All right. anything. Coming up. Partisanship. The story of <laughs> another American, a ballerina, it. held against her will in Moscow. She's charged with high treason over a $50 donation. We'll talk with her boyfriend about what's being done to free her and whether he thinks it's enough. Plus, the rift between the U.S. and Israel and fading American support for Israel's war with Hamas. Will Israel's Be Benjamin Netanyahu change course? We'll ask a spokesperson for the prime minister. And a spike in crime in Washington, and we're not talking about convenience store. We're talking about one of the most secure spaces in the world where the president spends hours at a time. That's coming up next. Feels like they're all actually playing Moscow together, so. Welcome back. We know that today marks one year of detention in a Russian jail for American reporter Evan Gerskovich, but he is not the only American Russian authorities are holding. 32-year-old Ksenia Karolina is an American dual citizen held in Russia on espionage charges. She, of course, denies those charges. The Russian native was on her way to see relatives when authorities grabbed her. They said she had given $50 to a Ukrainian charity in 2022. She now awaits trial in April. Joining us now is her boyfriend, Chris Van Heerden. Chris, thanks very much for joining us. First, I want to ask you, uh, have you been in, in contact with her and how is she feeling? Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, yes, I've been in contact with her via, via letters. She can write me a letter. I can write her a letter. These letters are being watched and read through the FSB. Um, she's doing, for the first time this week, I received a letter where she's finally sounding more positive. She's taking care of herself, she's exercising, meditating, reading a lot of books about law, um, going outside, which she did not do for almost six weeks. So she's doing a little bit better. Yeah. You said the FSB, that is the Russian security services, are, are monitoring the mail. So it must be hard for you to determine exactly what's behind those letters and, and the meaning behind some of the words, I would imagine, at, at any rate. Let me ask you, is, is she, do you consider or do you think that she is sort of a bargaining chip for the Putin regime to get extract something out of the United States, perhaps a hostage swap? My personal opinion, yes. My personal opinion is... That is what it is. I spoke to her lawyer, which is from Moscow. We finally secured a lawyer. And speaking to him, he told me, he said, look here, Chris, this is not going to be easy, but I'm very confident that I can get uh, talks going with a possible prisoner swap. So that tells me that's what they are trying to do. OK, that leads to my next question, Chris. And you're talking to the American government, I would assume. Um, what are they telling you? Are, are they encouraging or as much as you care to reveal at this point? Uh, do you think they're doing all that they can uh, to get her out? Well, I'm going to say no, because Christina is not home. Uh, until she's home, I will say they did everything they can. But I am in contact with the U.S. State Department. I am very hopeful that we will get Christina wrongfully detained, declared soon. And that's the problem right now. We've got to get her declared wrongfully detained. And I'm speaking to the U.S. State Department. I'm saying, what's holding this up? Well, we have to write up a report. I'm saying, what's holding up the report? Well, we don't know what Russia is charging her with. They say it is um, with treason, but they haven't made anything or announced anything on the senior's case, and that makes it very difficult on the U.S. side to declare wrongfully detained. Um, but I am in contact with the U.S. State Department. They have assured me that they are trying to get closer to Ksenia every single day. This is, at the moment, not possible because Russia, first of all, does not recognize the dual citizenship, uh -huh. so they do not allow any Americans near, but they are trying. All right. Chris Van Heerden, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us here. Uh, as Easter approaches, we wish the best for you and Ksenia. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Now I'll take a look at this. Russian President Vladimir Putin donned a simulator helmet 
in the cockpit of a helicopter during his visit to a combat training center in Russia. This was on Wednesday. He was touring military facilities, and he spoke to Russian Air Force pilots, and he denied claims that Russia intends to invade surrounding NATO nations. But he vowed that F-16 fighter jets from Western allies of Ukraine, like Poland, will be destroyed. That's some saber rattling right there. So, panel, uh, we're having our, our sort of daily research test. I think this is really interesting. Uh, let's go down the line and start with you, Aaron. Look at this picture. What do you see? Uh, well, for starters, the number one rule in politics is never put a hat on. So it's just, it's just yeah. never a good Michael move. Dukakis didn't yes, learn that in Michael 1988. Dukakis Unless it's a MAGA hat, right? Anyway. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, this is an attempt to look like a strong man in an instance where Putin is, is, knows that the world is not behind him, and that's what he's trying to show here, that he's stronger than okay, he is. Okay, quickly now, guys. I, I, I think it's a, a, an acknowledgement, but also he's trying to communicate that they understand this new era of warfare we are yeah. in is based on, you know, this is simulated training here, but drones and UADs and all this kind of stuff, that's the next frontier right. in the war. Kurt, looks like he's playing a video game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he says we have no aggressive intentions towards these states, and I think he's showing a picture that he has very aggressive intentions. Well, he's trying to look tough, and it is and very Dukakis-esque. It is very Darth yeah. Vader evidence. All right. <laughs> Here we go. I've, been, I've, been watching, I've been watching Three Body Problem on Netflix. That's what it brings to mind for this, for me or Heather. Okay, did you see this? The Marines are being asked to take matters into their own hands, quite literally, and do some DIY on their own barracks. In a video, Marine Camp Pendleton is offering a how-to guide on home repair. It all comes as the U.S. military faces scrutiny over living conditions for service members after a House hearing last month. Panel, the video has been getting mixed reviews. I mean, all right, it's the U.S. Marines. They're, you know, an elite fighting group, uh, and yet uh, they're going down to Home Depot or Lowe's or Ace, or I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a hardware company here, <laughs> and, and doing, uh, and here's part of the video here, and, you know, they're doing drywall, they're, they're doing all this stuff. Uh, I mean, is this, and it comes after, you know, a long history of problems with military housing. What do you think when you see that, Aaron? It's not a good look for the military to be having the people, our service members who are out there on the front lines protecting and serving our country, to be showing them, here's how you fix stuff because we aren't doing our job to provide you right. adequate. They're talking about mold mitigation. Yeah. Like, they yeah. should not be having Marines worrying about mold mitigation. Yeah, and it reminds me of a few years ago, the old Walter Reed, when it was still in the district oh, in yeah. Washington. Remember those stories? Mold, yeah. uh, horrible living conditions for wounded warriors who were re 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 rehabilitating, convalescing in Walter Reed. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah, this is one of those things where when I worked at the Oversight Committee back in the day, there was, this is one of the real bipartisan issues of scrutiny. We're looking at the conditions right. that we were having our service members live in. It's, it's disgraceful that yeah. this is something they even have to contemplate when, when we ask them to do so much for our country. Let's, let's bring an HGTV and just get it fixed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, this is yeah. absolutely it's a disgrace that we're even having this conversation. We're not taking care of our soldiers at the most basic level. I, I, I would add, I'm talk, talking to a few friends who are in the armed forces, there is an element of like, we, we can handle any condition. Sure. We'll make do with what we've got. We're fine. We don't need luxury items. There's that kind of mentality in the but military. Most. But correct. Yeah. There's a point where it starts getting ridiculous you know, thought, and embarrassing. When I first saw it, I thought recruiting problems, shortfalls in the military. But the, the Marines actually are hitting their quota, yeah, and unlike I, the other branches. Well, and I would add, too, that this is another side effect of not being able to fully fund the government for a full year cycle, piecemealing it together makes it hard to budget, hard to forecast, and actually costs more money yeah. than if we were able to, Congress was able to pass these budgets. All right, we're moving on. There's still much more ahead on the Hill. Reports tonight, the U.S. is signing off on more bombs and more war planes for Israel. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is calling it, quote, obscene. How will Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu react? We'll ask a key spokesperson. Plus, will the RNC strike back against NBC? How the Republican committee could make NBC pay this summer over firing former chairwoman Ron McDaniel. I'll ask Mick Mulvaney for his take coming up on The Hill on News Nation. Okay, welcome back to The Hill. When you need a billion dollars, which is basically the buy-in for a presidential can campaign in American history year 2024, who better to go to for cash than actual billionaires? After President Biden raised a reported $26 million last night in New York with the help of Presidents Clinton and Obama. Now, President Trump says he has plans to do him several million dollars better, announcing a fundraiser next week down in Palm Beach with his sights on a very big number, $33 million in one night. And consider this headline from the Washington Post. 
Quote, many GOP billionaires balked at January 6th. They're coming back to Trump. The article goes on to say, quote, the shift reflects many conservative billionaires' fears of President Biden's tax agenda, which, if approved, would drastically reduce their fortunes. Ah, uh, democracy. Pa- panel, they say the best <laughs> things in life are free. It's just that presidential campaigns aren't really among them. These very wealthy folks appear to be voting with their wallets to protect them against higher taxes under Biden. Is this a wise investment on the part of these very wealthy people? And I'm going to go first down to our friend Mick Mulvaney. Mick, what do you think? Uh, first of all, who's got this kind of cash? Some of these tickets are $800,000 to sit at the table with President Trump next week. Mick's got it. <laughs> yeah, you sort of got to ask the same question as to who raised all the money last night. Look, there's wealthy sure. people on both sides of the aisle who spend money on getting their politician elected. There's no question about it. What I think you're seeing, though, and the important part is the dynamic, which is there are a lot of folks who are not giving big checks to Donald Trump until he became the presumptive nominee. We talked, I think, uh-huh. a night or two ago on the show about the huge numbers that Biden had put up in the last quarter vis-a-vis what Trump had put up. I think he almost doubled his output. That, those numbers didn't represent the folks who were coming back to Trump since Nikki Haley got out of the race. I keep coming back to the, the night of the South Carolina uh, primary, the night when Trump essentially sewed everything up, um, and Woody Johnson was on the stage. Woody Johnson isn't from South Carolina, uh, but he does own the New York Jets. He does have a lot of money, and he was an ambassador right. under the Trump administration. That was my first indication the big money was coming back to Trump, and it wouldn't surprise me to see Trump exceed the $26 million that uh, Biden raised last night. All right, we, we talked about criticism from some of these people that are attending uh, this thing, supposedly next Saturday night down in Palm Beach. Uh, one of them being Robert Bigelow, who said in the wake of January 6th, uh, he certainly lost me as a supporter and as someone who would champion, and champion him. Uh, he showed that in that particular hour that he was no commander, uh, but Mr. Bigelow is apparently going to be front and center down there since uh, fortunes have changed and the political winds have shifted. What do you make of all? I mean, is this business as usual? Sound, yes, it feels it kind of swampy. Or well, let's be honest, both parties are going to have mo- an obscene amount of money in this election. No right. matter what the quarterly fundraising totals say, both the Democrats and the Republicans are going to be incredibly well financed by their respective billionaire class, and 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 that's just the reality of really the the, the post Citizens United landscape of, of politics and campaigns and, and fundraising. And I think if you look at the numbers, there's a lot of people out there who were completely against Donald Trump, but they're not going to vote for Joe Biden just yeah. because of. I mean, there are a lot of people. I mean, there's a of, difference between not voting for Joe Biden and giving someone eight hundred thousand dollars. There right? is, yeah. except that a, a lot of people say that I will take the policies over the person, and uh-huh. then there's a lot of people that say you shouldn't. Right. Okay. And so I think you're going to see a lot of people are coming out that said they would never support Donald Trump, and here they are supporting Donald Listen, Trump. Listen, if you're this rich, you're yeah. ruthless. You have no conscience. You're going to do whatever it takes to Real keep quick, your money. Real quick, please. Two things. Number one, like. It, To an average voter, the decision between lower taxes and having a democracy is an easy decision. We would choose having a democracy. The problem is these folks are unaffected because they're wealthy and powerful and can do whatever they want. Secondly, the real focus should not be on how they're raising. It's how they're going to spend. Donald Trump is spending his money to defend his legal cases. Democrats are putting those in field and GOTV and voter recognition. I really want to be clear about something. Republicans are as concerned about democracy as as Democrats are. They just view it very, very differently. And I think that as much as you're saying that people are, you know, that's what they're putting at stake. A lot of Republicans are saying democracy is at stake, too. This this sounds like a fertile ground, but we're going to have to move on really quickly. Okay, protests both inside and out disrupted that big Biden star-studded fundraiser last night in New York City. It featured those two former presidents, Obama and Clinton. The protests seem to be everywhere the president is in recent weeks, from the State of the Union to last night at Radio Radio City City Music Hall. Wow, that's hard. (laughs) Shame on you, Joe Biden! Okay, so despite those protests against the war in Israel and Gaza and with a widening rift with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, today the Biden administration said it would send billions of dollars worth of bombs and fighter jets to Israel for its fight against Hamas. Meanwhile, the U.S. is saying Israel has agreed to reschedule a canceled delegation trip to Washington to further discuss the ground offensive in southern Gaza and the city of Rafah. So joining me now is Tal Heinrich. She is a spokesperson for the Israel, Israeli's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Hi, Tal. It's good to see you. It's good to see you again, Mike. My pleasure to be joining you tonight. All righty. First of all, uh, why did the Prime Minister change his mind? Last week, he wasn't sending people to Washington and out of what appeared to be anger over the U.N. vote. Now, next week, we're going to get a delegation here. 
It was a bad timing. It would have sent double the wrong message to Hamas because it was right after uh, the U.S. decided to abstain on that vote at the United Nations, the one that decoupled the two issues of the ceasefire with the release of hostages. Uh, we saw it as a, an unfortunate departure from a consistent position that the U.S. has held since the beginning of the war on October 7th, um, that there will no, be no uh, humanitarian pause in the fighting without a release of hostages. Uh, just to remind you, this uh, resolution was celebrated Celebrated, was praised by Hamas, by Iran. It was supported by Russia and China, uh, who uh, objected previous resolutions okay. that linked the two issues together. So now uh, it's, it's, it's the right time. We can uh, move forward. We received clarifications from senior officials um, that, that doesn't constitute a change of policy. We're glad about that, but right. it doesn't ref- it's not reflected in the text, so to say. Okay, the $14 billion hung up in Congress, aid to Israel at this moment of need. Uh, Chuck Schumer on the floor calling for a change in leadership uh, in in Israel, obviously very controversial. Uh, You've got protesters greeting the president at every turn, no matter where he was, blocking Pennsylvania Avenue on his way to the State of the Union. Are Israeli-U.S. relations at a low point right now? I wouldn't say that. You know... um The overwhelming majority of Israelis support the war objectives. Uh, There's no question about it that uh, Hamas has to be eliminated. According to polls that we're seeing, also a solid majority of the American people understand why Hamas must be eliminated. You guys don't like terrorists, and you understand, uh, many of you, that Israel's war is not just Israel's war against Hamas. You know that terrorists all around the world, all all bed players, are watching what's happening in our region right now, and they're taking notes. And you will, uh, you know, unfortunately, Unfortunately, uh, what's, what begins in our region never, never stays in our region, and, and, and you suffer the consequences of terrorism <coughs> as well. So uh, we need to get the job done. Uh, we need to eliminate Hamas. We need to bring the hostages home. We need to make sure that Gaza will never pose a terror threat to Israel okay. again. And we do see eye to eye with Washington about these issues. Okay. 1,800 2,000-pound bombs. 500 500-pound bombs. All announced going to, the, uh, to Israel, to your government, to your military, to the IDF, from the administration. How badly are they needed? And what do you say to concerns from uh, people on the left, like Bernie Sanders, who said this is crazy, absurd, I believe he called it? What's absurd is giving immunity to uh, jihadi, bloodthirsty Hamas rapists. That's absurd. You know, for far too long, uh, we, we have lived under a constant threat of terrorism. And it's a decision that Israelis took as a nation. It's not about our government. It's not about the IDF. We took a decision as a nation, Mike, that we will no longer agree to life next to a terrorist enclave. This is why we must get the job done and get rid of Hamas. And what has Hamas brought upon the people of Gaza in their 16 years of rule? You know, misery and, 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 and bloodshed and violence. We all deserve something better. So the day after Hamas will be something different. Okay, Tal Heinrich, thank you for joining us. It looks like you're joining us from our New York studios. Appreciate, appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. Here's some information. Uh, okay, panel. Um, we got some contradictions here. The Biden administration uh, is sending these bombs, these armaments. They're, the president is facing loud and angry protests wherever he turns. Uh, it's hung up in Congress, as I said. Uh, Democrats, including Chuck Schumer, calling out Be- Benjamin Netanyahu from the floor of the Senate. What's going on here? It's a tight, it's a tight rope the president is, is walking. Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult one for particularly a Democratic president, I think, who has a kind of a progressive base that's, you know, for various reasons, I think due to a lot of misinformation, taking a position where they're sympathizing with a terrorist organization of Hamas. But I do think a large swath of American voters, and I'd be curious to hear your opinion on it, like, are generally weary of war. And I think, too, when you start to see the video footage of the implications of the bombing, it starts to change your opinion and voter sentiment has shifted. I think the president is reflecting that. But what I will say is Joe Biden stood up for Israel's right to defend itself, as he should, because it's not only the right thing to do for stability in the region, it's in the U.S. best net you know, they talk right. of the United States they, and Americans, okay. which we still have hostages there. I think Joe Biden, though, is also trying to talk out of both sides of That's his right. mouth on the one hand. He's doing the right thing, and then he's, he's saying to the, like, like he said to the protesters who came in last night and were calling uh, this genocide, he said, you're right. Yes. This isn't yeah. a genocide. Aaron, what, very quickly. You, 
I think that Joe Biden, the, the point is exactly right. Joe Biden is trying to have it both ways here, and he's not doing a good job with it. Because to your point, Israel is our best ally in the Middle East. And so doing anything other than supporting the mission for them to be able to maintain their sovereignty and get rid of Hamas will not be well, yeah, fruitful for Joe Biden. The position is clearly a reflection of divisions within the, within the Democratic Party. But also broad, sh- shifts in broadly broad American opinion. Right. Okay. Coming up, a wave of theft is hitting a presidential aircraft from Germany. <laughs> Journalists to politicians. <laughs> Reports of goodies being lifted from Air Force One. What's being stolen and what the Biden administration is doing to deal with the problem. All right. McDaniel, the former chairwoman of the Republican National Committee. According to a new report, the committee is weighing whether to limit NBC's access to the Republican National Convention this summer in Milwaukee. It would would be a response to the network letting her go less than a week after hiring her as a political contributor. Okay, so Mick, what could the RNC actually do to freeze NBC out of Milwaukee? Well, freeze them out of Milwaukee. I mean, the best way to look at this is that this is not a public event. This is sort of like Major League Baseball, right? Major League Baseball gets to decide who gets to cover their games, and the RNC will get a chance to decide who was going to cover their convention. I talked to Michael Watley a little bit today, and he referred me to the statement the RNC put out. The co-chair of the RNC. I think it's fair to say... I think it's fair to say they're pretty hot about this. Um, I mean, they pointed out that Jen Psaki walks into MSNBC with no difficulty. George Stephanopoulos is working at ABC with no difficulty. They point out that Chuck Todd actually started in Washington, D.C. as a political operative. Um, But you can go down a long list of Republicans who get pilloried every time they sign on with a media uh, outlet. If this is not just Ronna McDaniel, we talked about what happened to me at CBS. There's, you go Google yeah. uh, network criticized for hiring Republican, and it is a long list of people, and they're pretty hot about it. I think they're, they're intent on sending a message that this has got to stop one way or the other. Okay. All right, all right next item on the list here, reports of a major crime wave, tongue-in-cheek, happening in a surprising <laughs> location, Air Force One. So according to Politico, journalists traveling aboard Air Force One have a nasty habit of stealing all the branded knickknacks. It's gotten so bad, the president of the White House Correspondents Association, my friend Kelly O'Donnell, wrote a strongly worded email to the press corps. Uh, Mick, is this surprising? And let me ask you something. First of all, I've got my swamp uh, accreditation right here. Welcome aboard Air Force One. It's even got my name misspelled. So I, I can proudly say that I have ridden across, uh, aboard that aircraft, but it's not just journalists that are, uh, have sticky fingers. <laughs> yeah, nice. I, I, I've got, by the way, the, nice. the Air Force One notepads are absolutely fantastic. Oh, yeah, for there, you go, baby. Start. Look, there you go. I, I, I was never aware of, of, that we had a, a major problem. Everybody knows you're going to take little mementos. Yes, you do get little trinkets when you get on the airplane. I was never aware of people taking, apparently now the story's about silverware and pillowcases. <laughs> um, that was never wow. an issue when I was there. But if it is an issue, it's, it, it's going to have to stop. There's no question. Yeah. I, I, had to, I admit, I would cop to having a little embossed uh, cocktail napkin that says Air Force One. Okay, next. With many people celebrating Good Friday and getting ready for Easter on Sunday this weekend, the White House is prepping for its own annual ritual, the Easter egg roll. Ah, yes, a tradition that dates back to 1878 when President Rutherford B. Hayes agreed to open the White House grounds on Easter Monday. Ever since, presidents gather with parents and kids on the White House lawn to roll eggs with the Easter Bunny and participate in other Easter activities. This year's annual Easter egg roll will take place on Monday, where approximately 40,000 people are expected to participate, the theme being (laughs) egg-ucation. So, uh, Mick, real quick, there's a bunny, someone dressed in a bunny suit, parading around the South Grounds, and you have some inside information on who's inside the bunny suit. At least during the Trump administration. Well, we do. The bunny suit is probably about three and a half feet tall, so there was really only one member of the Trump administration who, would, who could fill the role, and that was our friend of the show, Sean Spicy Spicer, uh, who was the, uh, was the bunny the first year we were there. In fact, that may be him right there in the, in, in the outfit. So uh, There we go. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Mick. Okay, guys, have you ever been to the Easter egg roll on the South Lawn? I have. It's a melee. I mean, it's a 40,000 people. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Horrible, They're moving actually. them through, and you're waiting in line, and it's going to be rainy and nasty. Seems like the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> yeah, it is. I don't want to go. As yeah. someone who is, uh, so a lot of offices get tickets to distribute to this, sure. it's a congressional office, and it is 
a highly coveted ticket from both sides of the yeah. aisle, no matter who's president. I'd rather go on it. Only yeah. one time. Yeah, you do. only go to that thing one time, right? It, if you but have it kids. brought one of my favorite political moments I've ever seen on camera, which was Joe Biden talking to the press and then the Easter Bunny escorting him away. And all tied up. All right. So we know that was probably a press secretary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Panel, thank you very much. Still to come, a race to the right in San Francisco as a Democratic candidate for mayor is calling for the National Guard to patrol downtown to battle the drug epidemic there. How it's provoking a political civil war within the Democratic Party in that city. I'll discuss all of this with the host of On Balance, Leland Vitter. That's coming up next. Chris has been one of the first people to actually let me on and have a conversation. And you have a platform here to make the case. CNN has an agenda. MSNBC has an agenda. News Nation plays it pretty much straight up and down the line. Welcome back. Some Democratic mayoral candidates in San Francisco are starting to campaign on more conservative ideas. Now, of course, that is an unusual move in a city famously famous for its progressive politics. And so one of those Democrats is mayoral candidate Mark Farrell, who's asking California to send more National Guard troops into the city to fight the fentanyl crisis, principally in the city's Tenderloin District. Another candidate, Daniel Lurie, who's the heir to the Levi Strauss fortune, is also touting tougher policies that address the city's drug problem, calling for a citywide, quote, state of emergency. Okay, so On Balance host Leland Vitter joins me now to discuss. Leland, do you think these ideas... I mean, this is San Francisco we're talking about. It is. A place where Nancy Pelosi is considered too conservative by, by many of the population True. there. True. 